Uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, as Forrest mentioned, I'm Sarah Shivers. And today I'm going to be talking about analyzing agricultural response to drought in the Central Valley using both avarice and master imagery. And um, I'll have time for questions at the end, but if you have any burning questions or something's unclear, feel free to stop me in the middle of the presentation. So uh, a few acknowledgments before I begin to my collaborators and committee members, Dar Roberts, Joe McFadden, and Naomi Tate, to NASA and JPL for the data that I'm using, to the, to the National Science Foundation for my funding, and to my lab and lab mates in the visualization and image processing for environmental research lab. So California agriculture is different from the agriculture in a lot of states for a few reasons. Uh, one, it's highly diverse. Um, California grows over 400 commodities. It's also very important. So two thirds of the fruits and nuts in the United States and about one third of the vegetables are grown in California. And this includes a lot of crops that are almost exclusively grown in California, including walnuts, figs, olives, and pistachios amongst, amongst others. Uh, because California has a semi-arid landscape, that means that we have over 9 million irrigated acres. And the Central Valley is actually one of the world's largest contiguous areas of high irrigation density. So because of this, roughly 80% of our managed water is used for agriculture. And agriculture and its water inputs are threatened by increasing risk of severe drought in California. So California experiences cyclical droughts, but the mean and extreme temperatures in California are expected to increase in the next century, which will increase the likelihood of experiencing severe droughts like we saw from 2012 to 2016. And because agriculture uses so much of the state's water, it's really important that we better understand how agriculture is changing with and responding to drought so that we can better anticipate the future of our agricultural landscape. And one way we can do this is through remote sensing. So today I'll be talking about three methods of using remote sensing to better understand agriculture through drought. So first I'll be talking about studying shifts in cropping patterns through hyperspectral imagery. This includes classifying crops into categories of similar water use and seeing how those categories are changing in their cropped area from 2013 to 2015. I'll then be looking at analyzing crop stress through thermal infrared imagery. I'll be studying thermal patterns of different crops to see how they are faring over drought. And finally, identifying measurable evapotranspiration through water vapor imagery. Uh, this will be using the water vapor imagery and the paired reflectance imagery to kind of study the link between the surface and the atmosphere. So the data that I'm using for this work is from the Hesperia Airborne Campaign. It's a NASA flight campaign that's been flown around California uh, from 2013 to 2017. It flies two sensors, Avaris and Master, to look at the scientific potential of having paired hyperspectral and thermal imagery together. So Avaris has 224 spectrally contiguous bands from the visible through the shortwave infrared at an 18 meter spatial resolution. And for my work, I'm using two data products, the reflectance imagery and the water vapor imagery. Master has eight <coughs> thermal bands that are representing the proposed bands of a future Hesperia satellite, um, which has been flagged for development in the recent NASA Decadal Survey. Uh, it has a 36 meter spatial resolution, and for my work I'm using the land surface temperature product. My study area is part of the southern central valley between Bakersfield and Fresno. It goes through parts of four different counties, Kern, Kings, Tulare, and Fresno. And for the first two parts of my study, I'm using three different image dates, 2013, 14, and 15. So starting with assessing changes in planting decisions using hyperspectral imagery. So hyperspectral imagery has higher discriminatory power than multispectral sensors. And so for this part, I wanted to both look at the potential of using hyperspectral imagery to classify crops using just one image date, which would improve upon current methods by allowing for real time or mid season growing assessments. I also wanted to use this information to then look at how crops are changing with drought. So the methods overview for this portion, I'm gonna quantify sub-pixel land cover to see which fields are actively growing in my image. I'm then gonna classify pixels by crop type. 
I'm splitting crops into categories of similar water use that I'll go through. I'm going to improve the classification results for improved accuracy by my knowledge of the field boundaries, the green vegetation cover, and using a majority filter. And then using the resultant crop maps from 2013, 14, and 15, I'm going to look at changes in planted areas. So the crop categories I'm using for this study are the nine listed above. They're ordered from highest water use to lowest water use in my study area. And they are categories of similar water use that are defined by <coughs> the Department of Water Resources. These are nine categories that are the prevalent crops in my study area in June. So starting with the subpixel unmixing for uh, determining which fields are actively growing, I'm using a method called multiple end member spectral mixture analysis, or MESMA. The way it works is that imagine a field that is imaged by pixels. A MESMA uses the measured reflectance spectrum from a pixel and then breaks it down into its subcomponents. So in this example, using the measured reflectance spectra, uh, MESMA was able to partition it into 40% tree and 60% soil. And this would be a big improvement upon like a traditional classifier that would classify one pixel by as one type of land cover. So this results in a map like this. This is my study area. Um, this is a MESMA map that is broken down by non-photosynthetic vegetation, so bark or dead leaves or dead grass, green vegetation, and soil. And zoomed in, um, the map looks something like this. So with this information, I can see what was growing at that time, or which fields had, had actively growing crops during that time. I then used a random forest classifier to classify each pixel into one of the nine crop categories that I listed um, previously. So random forest is a machine learning algorithm that populates a series of decision trees that vote on the correct class. And it's had a lot of proven success in similar studies. So I, I broke my data into training and validation data, 30% validation and 70% training. The validation and training data that I'm using is from the county crop polygons um, that were supplied by the four counties that, I, that my study site goes through from the Cal Ag Pesticide Permitting Program that um, lists which fields are growing which types of crops. Um, I then randomly sampled 50,000 pixels from each of, these, each of my um, imagery, images that all the pixels had at least 50% green vegetation or more. And then I used those pixels um, and put them into the random forest, populated 500 trees for my classifier. Um, I knew that this was going to have some error in it, the classification, so I wanted to improve upon the accuracy through a reclassification in two ways. So one, I only wanted to classify pixels that were in fields that were actively growing. So I used the field boundaries and my MESMA run to only classify those pixels. And then I used a majority filter to reclassify um, all pixels in one field as the same type of crop to whatever the majority of pixels in that field were classified as, uh, with the idea that most fields are only growing one type of crop. So the results for this, um, here's a map from one of the years, um, an example of what the classification looked like. So uh, there were high pixel level accuracies after this classification. You can see that overall um, the accuracy was about 95% for all of the pixels and all of the crops. Now what can we do with this data? Well, looking at a subsection, I'm going to give some example of some patterns that we start to see. So 2013, 14, and 15, the subsection of my area, um, when we look at this we can start to see a few things. For example, um, tomato crops increased in this area. The deciduous crops, which include like cherries and peaches and plums, things like that, are staying relatively stable, maybe a bit of an increase over drought. And alfalfa is uh, declining in this portion. But this is just a portion of the study area. So looking at the numbers overall, um, we can look at declines by crop category over drought. So this is, um, on the y-axis, we have percentage change in cropped area from 2013 to 15. And the x-axis, the bars, are my different crop types. The final bar is the total crop um, acreage. It declined by about 8% from 2013 to 15. So fields overall were being fallowed. But which fields were fallowed? 
um, was very different by crop type. So the red bars are ones that showed more than a 10% decline over these three years. So those are alfalfa, corn, cotton, and other row crops. The purple bars are ones that showed less than a 10% decline or increase over the course of drought. Almonds and pistachios, other deciduous and subtropical, my tree crops. And then vines and tomatoes are the ones that increased uh, more than 10%. So I wanted to ask maybe what is driving these changes? Uh, are farmers following fields that are water intensive? Is that something that is influencing their, their decision making as the drought progresses? So this is the same y-axis percentage change in area from 2013 to 15, but now I'm plotting it against the average water use for each of those crop categories. And I wanted to see if there was a correlation here, which there does not seem to be. So it doesn't seem like farmers are prioritizing their crops that don't use much water. Rather, when you look at the crops broken down by their growing investment, so this is kind of their, their lifespan, um, annual versus perennial crops, but also this is highly correlated usually to the value of those crops. The annual crops are usually lower value, perennial crops higher value. Um, it seems that farmers are following their annual crops, the ones that are easier to take out of production. They're leaving their perennial crops that they're getting more money for and that would be harder to fallow. And I think these results then ask the question, what will this mean for our agricultural landscape in the future as we see more droughts and the crops are moving towards more perennial crops, what will this mean for our water resources? Because the perennial crops are not necessarily the less water intensive crops. So moving this research forward, um, some ways I'd like to um, improve upon it in the future include um, a comparison with how this classification would go with either Landsat or Sentinel. Um, a temporal analysis of transferability would be really important. So how would this classification, uh, how accurate would it be in April versus November? Um, I think this will, this will play a large role in, in how we can scale this up. And then an in-depth study of the band importance. So which wavelengths are the key wavelengths for capturing the separability between classes? So in that part, I talked about how different types of crops are changing over drought. And now in this section, I want to look at the health of crops over drought. So I'll be talking about analyzing stress through drought using thermal infrared imagery. So thermal infrared imagery um, can be useful as a tool for understanding plant health and functioning with the idea that plants that have adequate water will transpire to cool themselves off. So they'll have lower temperatures Whereas plants that run out of water and can't transpire, their temperatures will go up because, because they're not able to cool themselves off. So it's a really great tool for looking at stress in crops. However, the challenge here is that land surface temperature data is affected by many things other than stress. So the time of day of the flight and the air temperature will affect the land surface, as will the fractional cover, how much green vegetation there is, uh, the surface structure, which will cast shadows and change the temperature. And then the moisture. Uh, cooler things uh, tend to be more moist, and this will affect the, the temperature as well. So the key here is trying to figure out what is normal for a field in order to assess stress. So this is a thermal image. This is from the master imagery of my study area showing the temperature of fields. But I need to know what I expect that temperature of the field to be so that I know whether it's too hot or too cool in order to assess stress. So instead of comparing actual temperatures of different crops against each other, I'm going to be uh, modeling the temperatures. So my method overview is to model the expected temperature of each pixel and then compare the temperature that I model to what's actually measured in order to assess stress. And then using this information, I will look at stress between different crop groups. So for this portion, I'm going to focus on 11 perennial crops, fruit and nut trees, um, trees and vines. So the reason I'm doing this is because they are prevalent in my study area, by far the most prevalent types. They're um, economically important. And also, they're the ones that I saw in the last part of the study that are staying put through drought. So, they're not able to be as easily fallowed when there's not enough water, so how is their health being affected? So I'm modeling the expected temperature of every pixel um, using 
the um, combination, the sum of its fractional components multiplied by their expected temperatures. So the fractional components I'm getting from the subpixel and mixing from the MESMA run that I showed earlier. Uh, the reason that this is important is because land surface temperature and green vegetation inversely correlate. So on the y-axis, land surface temperature, on the x-axis, green vegetation fraction. And for the reasons that I talked about before, because plants transpire, we know that the more green vegetation there is in a pixel, the cooler it will be. For modeling the expected temperatures of all of my, of my different components, uh, for the green vegetation, I'm using the average land surface temperature for all pure pixels in each of these three different crop groups. So nut trees, deciduous fruit, and citrus. So I'm using all pure pixels of nut trees, and I'm taking that average temperature, and then for any pixel that has some nut tree in it, it will have that core temperature as, it, as its expected green vegetation temperature. The reason I chose these three categories is because I, they share common structural and phenologic properties that I thought would, um, would affect their temperature patterns. So I tested this out, this hypothesis. Um, this is a Tukey's post hoc um, analysis after a one-way ANOVA, looking at these three crop groups that I listed, land surface temperature on the y-axis, and the three crop categories, citrus, deciduous fruit, and nut trees. And what this shows is that they do, those three categories do have statistically significantly different thermal properties, with citrus showing the warmest temperatures and nut trees showing the coolest temperatures. For the soil and the non-photosynthetic vegetation, I'm using the average land surface temperature for all pure pixels of those two surface types throughout my study scene. And so now we can use this information to compare deviations off of our measured temperature from master. So I calculated a residual, which is the measured temperature minus the model temperature. And any pixel then that has a um, negative residual will be cooler than is expected given its different uh, properties. And a positive residual is warmer than expected. So these are the summed uh, residuals by those 11 crop types over the course of drought. So on the y-axis, the sum residual, I took the residual of every pixel of a certain crop type for 2013, 14, and 15, and these are those three years summed. Um, the higher the residual, the hotter it is above what's expected, so I marked that with most stress, and then the coolest would be least stressed. Uh, you can see that pistachios and cherries are showing high stress over the course of drought, and tangerine, peaches, walnuts, and nectarines are showing less stress. So I wanted to see whether this made any sense beyond conceptually. So I looked at another measure of analyzing crop stress, um, which is through um, yields in my study area. So the same plot that I showed you above it, uh, in the previous slide is now on top. And below it, there is a new graph which is percentage change in yield per acre from 2013 to 2015. I got this information from the um, statistic, uh, agricultural statistics reports from the four counties which my study area goes through. And so, for example, pistachio in 2013 what had a yield of 1.3 tons per acre, and in 2015 it was down to 0.4, so a decline of about 70%. So with this yield data, um, the crops are ordered in the same way in both of, the, both of the bar charts. And you can see that pistachios and cherries are showing large declines in yield and also high stress as far as the residuals. And then uh, tangerine is showing an improvement over the course of drought and also seems to be a happy crop as far as the residuals are concerned. When you look at the same information plotted against each other, uh, you can see that they do correlate with an R-squared of 0.75 for my 11 crop types. So this is percentage change in yield per acre on the y-axis and the sum residual on the x-axis. So this uh, is exciting. It shows that the residuals actually do correlate with um, yield and are showing what we expect it to show. And it also means that we could use temperature residuals to start to estimate what the yields of crops might look like over time, or at least pinpoint which ones we think are gonna be really hard hit by the drought. 
Um, I also wanted to just talk a little bit about what this means for management implications. So looking at my nut crops, um, this is the same plot as before, but just the nut crops now, changes in yield per acre and some residual. The walnuts did well over the course of drought. Their yields were not hit, and they had um, low residuals, whereas the pistachios were quite hard hit by the drought as far as yields. Now, this is a quote from UC Drought Management that says, the walnut doesn't appear to be a strong candidate for successful def regulated deficit irrigation as other permanent crops, such as almonds or pistachios. So walnuts, we would not expect to do that well in drought. They're not gonna do well with deficit irrigation, but they're doing really well. So I think maybe what we're seeing here is that farmers are prioritizing their water towards those crops they know might be really hard hit in drought. And the ones that are supposedly more drought tolerant are not getting as much water, um, such as the pistachios, and being harder hit. So I thought that was interesting that it showed maybe something a little opposite of what at least I, I expected to see. So with this information, we can also have a map of the land surface temperature residuals. And with this map, we can identify which fields are the most stressed. And then further, we can use the pixel level residual data to look within fields and actually see which parts of their fields are most stressed. So this could be a really useful tool for better using our water resources, um, pinpointing which fields are actually the ones that are, are hurt, being hurt, uh, being stressed, and be able to prioritize our water towards those fields or to those parts of fields that are the ones that are showing stress. So finally, talking about um, the last portion, identifying measurable evapotranspiration through water vapor imagery. This is the least developed portion of my research, and I don't have results like the other two sections, but I did want to share to you the way that I'm going to be moving this research forward. So the idea here is that extreme irrigation accelerates the hydrologic cycle through increased evapotranspiration. So there's so much evapotranspiration in the Central Valley that it's been shown to alter um, regional atmospheric circulation in the southwest. And this extreme irrigation then builds up the water column. So we have uh, data as far as the water vapor column, and we can use this information to better understand about the transpiration. So this idea has been explored before through Ogajemio in 2002 who looked at evaluating the relationship between avarice water vapor and poplar plantation evapotranspiration. And this is a conceptual schematic from his paper. And what it shows is that a column water vapor is expected to be higher over fields that are transpiring a lot. And this will also be affected by the wind of that day and the direction to which we will see a water vapor gradient. So uh, what he found is that the results that he got, the direction and the magnitude of the water vapor over fields were consistent with what he would expect given the transpiration rates of the poplars and the wind direction of that day. So he found that water vapor imagery can be used to look at evapotranspiration under certain boundary layer conditions. So I'm gonna expand upon this work spatially and temporally in the Central Valley. Um, that the water vapor imagery is uh, derived using the atmospheric removal algorithm, ATRO, from Bo Kai Gao. Um, generally, the way it works is that it uses radiance imagery, converts it to top of atmosphere reflectance imagery, and then using radiative transfer models, it estimates the gases in the atmosphere and their transmittances. And then using the um, different water vapor absorption features, it then estimates a pixel level water vapor estimate. So the result is water vapor imagery that looks like this over my study area. So with the water vapor imagery and the reflectance imagery and the thermal imagery, we now have a lot of information about the ground surface and its corresponding water vapor that we can start to look at the link between the atmosphere and the surface. So for this part, I'm going to be asking the following research questions. Under which atmospheric surface conditions is plant transpiration detectable with an aerial imaging spectrometer? And then how do fields of varying crop types differ in their water vapor patterns? So here's some example imagery, um, reflectance on the left. Um, the green portions show green vegetation, whereas the pink is soil, and it's, it's water, paired water vapor imagery. So I'm gonna be looking at the correlation between green vegetation and, and the water vapor. And then I'm gonna be looking at the gradients over fields um, and comparing the 
uh, direction and slope of those gradients um, with the conditions of the day. And I hope to have future results, um, interesting results for that to share with you later on. Okay, so the takeaways here are that paired thermal and hyperspectral imagery can lead to enhanced understanding of crop health and decision making. So they can be used to better understand um, planting decisions as far as what farmers are, are planting and then used to analyze maybe what are driving those decisions. Uh, we can also use the thermal imagery to better understand the health of those crops that are staying put. Um, with this information, we learned that perennial higher value crops are being prioritized over drought. And also that like drought adaptive fruit and nut crops may actually end up being harder hit by drought uh, given what we saw from the walnut example. So um, I am happy to take any questions. Um, I will leave you with the following question of what does this all mean for the future of California's agriculture and water resources? So thanks so much for having me here today.